Hi, I'm Dr. Amy Robbins, and welcome to the Life, Death, and Space Between podcast. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist and medium. I know it seems like a strange combination, but that gives me a unique view of life and death. Death can be scary. I get that. That's why I'm doing this. I want to help people explore life, death, and what it all means. We are born and we die. What we do in the middle is the space between. Hi, and welcome to Life, Death, and the Space Between podcast. Today on the podcast, I'm excited to welcome Kevin Fortune. He is a true Renaissance man. He is a multi-instrumentalist playing saxes, flutes, clarinets, oboe, guitar, bass, keyboards, synthesizers, and percussion. He has been a session musician and recording engineer for over 40 years, working with many greats, including Miles Davis, and has been a composer for over 45 years. Kevin's been involved in leading edge electronics, prototyping, and building his own synthesizers and other electronic goodies, and contributing to the building of at least seven studios in LA and the Bay Area. And at the same time, he has had a parallel career in the healing arts as a body worker, a tantra teacher, author, and counselor. He is also a gifted intuitive who channels the grand spirit, Dr. Peebles. Kevin is a space music pioneer whose, whose music is heard on hundreds of radio, internet, and television programs worldwide and has added a musical mastery to hundreds of recordings. He has been featured as a soloist on many albums by Paul Avaneros, including the Grammy-winning Grace. Kevin's music is inspired by his near-death experiences, and today we are going to be talking to Kevin about his inspired music. But if you really want to dig deeper and hear more about Kevin and his experiences, he will be doing a webinar on March 5th at the University of Heaven. So you can head on over to universityofheaven.com and sign up for his webinar there, which will dig a little deeper into his experiences than where we are today. So Kevin, welcome to the show today. Thank you. It's great to be here. It's great to have you. So tell me a little bit about your music and what you're best known for. Well, I believe I'm best known for um, what would be called space music. Space music is a term that um, happened in the 70s, pretty much. Um, And it's not just like outer space music. It's more like music for the space that you're in. It's a music that has a spaciousness that, uh, that is... Uh, probably more contemplative. Um, <clears throat> I've done a lot of um, different kinds of music, but uh, again, I'm most known for that kind of um, instrumental, contemplative, large space uh, music. It's kind of like the, the soundtrack for the movie that you're in. Okay. And, <laughs> and this you do just on your own, in addition to everything else we talked about. Yeah, this was something that, um, you know, I I was doing music since I was a kid and playing in all kinds of bands and orchestras and ensembles and things like that. And um, we'll get into this in a minute. But, you know, after my near-death experience, um, there was a kind of intimacy that I experienced in the connection with music that... uh, created a different yearning or a different inner dialogue for me so that the, you know, there was no space music then. This was in the 60s. Tell me what <clears throat> happened to you and why, because it sounds like you were into music before. Yes. I'm really curious because I don't know what your near-death experiences were. Typically, I know what happened to people before I talk to them, but I kind of am yeah. I, I like the suspicion of it at times because I think it leads to an interesting conversation when I don't know the details behind it. So tell me what, sure, sure. what happened to you and why, and how it's changed your music and inspired your music. Sure. Well, I, I'd have to backtrack a little bit, uh, like about six months before that experience. <clears throat> I was um, 17, toward the end of my 17th year, and I had what... 
we could call now a kundalini opening, a kundalini awakening. And how that translated for me was a kind of life force energy that put me in a creative swoon. I was doing everything creative I could get my hands on. I was playing every instrument I could get my hands on in various organizations. I was painting, I was writing poetry, I was sculpting, I was in plays. So every creative expression, uh, I was just going after it. And who needs to sleep when you're 17? So So when you say Kundalini experience, mm -hmm. can you explain to my listeners what exactly that means? Kundalini is a term that uh, it means coiled. And Kundalini energy is often visualized as a serpent coiled sleeping in the pelvis. This is your life force energy. It can Mm -hmm. be called sexual energy, but that has so many other connotations that that we're going to call it life force energy. Mm -hmm. And so this life force energy, uh, it may never awaken in someone's lifetime, or it may, or you can study and open it. Mm -hmm. Um, Kundalini yoga, people. Kundalini yoga and tantra and things like that. Right. But this happened to me spontaneously. And at 17, I knew nothing about any of this. So here's this life force energy opening and more psychic energy than I'd had before, which I already had some, but no permission for. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And so here's this, this huge life force, it's like this river of flowing creative energy. And as I said, I was in a swoon. It was just amazing. And I thought, this is great. Life is good. <laughs> you know, I like this because I hadn't liked life too much before that. Mm-hmm. Um, and and nothing, you didn't do anything. It just no, opened. It just opened. It was a, a gift, I suppose. But I knew nothing about it. If, if I saw a kid, <laughs> if I saw myself, I would have definitely tell him about the care and feeding of that kind of energy. So I just spent it. You know, I just expressed, 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 and didn't sleep and mm-hmm. didn't feel like I needed to. And after about six months of that, I got very sick, of course. Well, and it's interesting because I'm a psychologist. And Mm -hmm. so I think there were probably people who would have thought that you were bipolar. Could be, but I kind of kept it to myself. And Mm -hmm. people were just more curious about all the creativity that was going on. Right. But I think it speaks to the line. Yes. At the line, definitely. Mm-hmm. There, is, there is definitely a line there. So my mother took me down to the local doctor who gave me a big shot of penicillin. And I remember sitting, they make you wait in case you have a reaction. Well, I had a reaction. I was sitting in this chair and I started to feel very nauseous. And I said to my mom, wow, I, th- I think I need to I think I need to throw up. And she said, well, there's a sink over there. And in the meantime, from my feet started to go numb and this numbness was spreading up my legs and I tried to get up to go to the over to the sink but nothing worked and I was just falling to to the ground right about the time it hit my heart and it stopped my heart and um, I remember having a reflex like I didn't want to hit my face on the floor so I pulled back and jerked right out of my body and I was hovering over the scene watching you know, my mom and the doctor coming over and they're trying to revive me. And in the meantime, I had an experience of looking at this body and realizing it didn't look real to me. I could have put my hand through it. Hmm. You know, that Mm -hmm. body didn't feel real where I was. And my perspective of viewing this felt more real to me. Unusual and strange, but it felt like this is me. And I'm looking down at this body that appeared to be almost like the spirit world. I mean, it was, it was almost transparent. Mm-hmm. And so I'm watching this and, you know, it's, this is just a way of talking about it because the experience was not something that is easily explainable, but <clears throat> I was watching what was happening and over, I'll just say over my left shoulder, I felt like there was something really amazing and exciting and I really wanted to see it. And I was just, again, this is just a way of talking about it because there weren't those kinds of gestures, but it was as if I was starting to turn my head to look at it, but my eyes were still looking at my body. Hmm. And right at that instant, I said, I think he's coming around now. 
And I, and I kind of went, he is. And the next <laughs> thing I'm looking up at the ceiling and here are, you know, everybody, these concerned faces looking down at me and I'm lying there thinking, I'm more okay than you could possibly know. <laughs> I felt like, okay, I, I got this. This is, there's nothing. I realized then that death was perfectly safe. There was nothing oh. wrong with it. And I never felt safe a day in my life. That's another story. But um, so I, I just felt incredibly calm. And years later, um, I, when I was introduced, I've always been around channelers and uh, spirit guides and things like that. And mm -hmm. the, the spirit guide that I uh, began to channel, I had spoken to him through s several other people. And I say him, what a lot of people don't realize is that these um, beings who have a name, in this case, Dr. Peebles, um, he said he chose that name because people wouldn't take it too seriously. Mm -hmm. too mm -hmm. But um, it's a collective. It's a spiritual collective. You know, Dr. Peebles is a collective, and a lot of other names like that are collective of spirits that are vibrationally harmonious and are a similar place in their evolution and and um, study and investigation and um, their service. So, uh, but one of the things that he told me was that um, had I actually turned around, I would not have come back. If I had actually looked at it, I would not have come back because he said, you weren't enjoying being here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you had, that I had taken on so much in this lifetime that um, he said, you, you, got down here and were a little cocky that, you know, you could do all of these things and accomplish all of this stuff. And he said, you realize you've kind of bitten off more than you can chew. And I said, why did I do that? And he said, we were wondering the same thing because <laughs> 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 we get to choose this. But he said, you know, you right. had a contract and you weren't, you didn't, you hadn't finished your contract. So you were, you were going to stay. So some part of me chose, okay, I guess I'm going to stay and, and see this out. Um, and this all happened, your channeling of him happened post. Oh, much later. Yeah, the, yeah. And you weren't channeling before. No, I was not. Okay. Just, you had just been exposed to those things. Yes. Okay. And always been, always been drawn to it, always been drawn to the spirit side and mm -hmm. had a, um, such a curiosity about the mystical mm -hmm. in various forms and religions and things like that. Those things are always interesting to me. Um, so uh, that's the first near death experience that I had. At, okay. Yeah, I was 18 when that happened. And, um, after that, my, my perspective changed. It was, it, it fundamentally changed my existential, uh, perspective, I guess you would say that, um, even though I was still caught up in, all of the personality preoccupations, you know, and the fears and everything else. Now there is a part of me that knew better. And if I took the time to tune into that or knew differently, that um, I, I never, I had never doubted before, but it was really solid now about the spirit world and that this is only one small fragment of who we are. Mm -hmm. I realized that when I was 18. And so that, that was big. Isn't that freeing? I mean, that's mm -hmm. around the age where I had my spiritual opening. I was, uh -huh. I was 24 ish, but my mm -hmm. aunt passed away and that's what sort of led to that. Her visits to me opened me up in a way that I mean, my anxiety that I struggled with for a long time kind of disappeared <laughs> after I realized that we don't uh -huh. really die. Mm hmm. So what was the second experience? The second one was <clears throat> kind of unusual. It was very different. Um, I was probably 36 was another 18 years, basically. Huh. And, which, um, is, which is interesting to think about. I don't know a lot about numerology, but I'm, I'm Jewish. And 18 is high, which means life. So mm -hmm. it just makes me wonder what, what, what that all means. I've had, I've had astrologers say, well, that's significant, you know, for, because of this return and that return and all that sort of stuff. Um, so I, I think I was probably pretty stressed. I was at the, uh, my acupuncturist and she was doing a, you know, had put 
needles in and I was lying there and suddenly I couldn't breathe. I just stopped breathing. I could not take a breath and everything was shutting down and she was pulling needles out and uh, that wasn't happening. So she left to go call the paramedics and, um, and in the meantime, I left, I just popped out of my body except because I've had this experience before, I stopped it halfway. So I could f- experience being in both planes at the same time. Mm-hmm. And that was really fascinating. It was a whole new level of understanding. So I'm halfway out of my body, which was very, it was struggling, couldn't breathe, um, and turning non-standard colors. <laughs> and did you feel <laughs> that or no? What was interesting is that I could feel both. I was in both places. I could feel, you know, so my my spirit self was looking down at the top of my head and I go, oh, you're losing some hair there. I mean, I could literally see all of that. And, um, and I felt this concern, like, what can we do for you? I, I realized then that every day when we awake, we're channeling. You're channeling your higher self when you wake up in the morning. Mm-hmm. At night, you're traveling wherever wherever we go. We're, mm-hmm. we're gone. We leave this body for a while. Mm-hmm. And then you're channeling yourself. So here is the self that I was channeling looking at this body. And I realized the, the incredible loving intimacy and marriage that this is of, of the higher self that we are that is channeled into this human personality Mm -hmm. and uh i I felt this tremendous love for this for kevin here lying on the table struggling it's like oh what can we do for you you're really having a hard time and just felt so um compassionate Compassionate. and loving toward this being who is struggling but not concerned in a way you know it wasn't a fear place at all the personality would have been afraid for another person in that but the spirit was not there was no you know Love and fear are opposites, really. And so here's this love and compassion. And meanwhile, the acupuncturist came in and grabbed my upper lip and jabbed a needle in it because it would bring circulation up into the, into the head, mm-hmm. which kept me from just going up. And so I'm still out of the body, and I'm watching the paramedics show up. And I, <laughs> I remember being very uh, curious and liking the uh, all their little test equipment stuff that it had really gotten miniaturized and mm-hmm. battery operated and they were hooking me up and oh that's really cool stuff you know because <laughs> i you know i love science and all of that sort of thing so um so in the meantime i i came around and i just found myself moving back into my body unfortunately my lungs had taken on a lot of fluid so i could not lay down for two or three weeks because I would choke. There was so much fluid in my lungs. So I just sat and coughed and stuff for about two or three weeks after that. And did you feel like at that point you made the choice to return to your body as well? Or did you feel like it wasn't a choice? It was a choice. No, it was a choice. I mean, I could have left then too, but I knew so much more um, by the time I was 36 about all of this sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, There was no part of me since I was 18 that needed any proof whatsoever, you know, or had to investigate because I wasn't sure I had no doubt at all. Mm-hmm. So, so when I was 36, it was like, I realized, okay, I, I knew, I knew for a fact I hadn't finished my contract and uh, for whatever stress I was in that um, it really wasn't, you know, in the, <laughs> In the light of all eternity, how important is this bit of stress that my personality is, is struggling with? Undergoing. Oh, what a you know, great there was question. A, there was a, um, just quickly, um, I, I don't remember the names, but there was a guy that I heard on, I don't know, Fresh Air or something like that, who had written a book about that he jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge when he commit suicide, but mm-hmm. he lived. And one of the things that really... Um, touched me was that he said that the minute his foot left the bridge, all his troubles vanished. 
He only had one trouble, and that was heading straight for the water. <laughs> that was the only problem he had to deal with. You're going to wait for that, right? But like exactly for him. But 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 he said that everything that he was worried about and that he wanted to kill himself over just evaporated. And he was mm. thinking, why was I so attached to all of that stuff? And then he wound up surviving. And so he wrote a book and he interviewed other people who had similar experiences of, of you know, sort of failed suicide things or jumping. So anyway. But his, he didn't have a near-death experience. He just had like a, probably some sort of soul. It, I guess it wasn't yeah. near death, but he's not describing he had a it. a near miss. Right. <laughs> right. He survived the fall, um, but I don't think he was out of his body. I think he just, that experience, because of, you know, in order to leave a bridge like that, you have to let go. Mm-hmm. You have to let go of something. And he let go of everything. Right. So so then nothing was bothering him except <laughs> heading for the water down below. That well, was and there it. had to have been some sort of mm-hmm. instantaneous soul connection of I think so. This and the fact that matter. Yeah, and the fact that he's what he's done is turned that into service by writing about it, by exploring it, by you know, exploring the consciousness of that act and other people's choices in that in that way. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So I, I just want to take a few more minutes because I know you're going to dive in way deeper to all of your music and, <laughs> and how that has been affected. But can you just tell me briefly, when you say you channel music, some of my listeners may have never heard of channeling before. I mean, I know mm-hmm. I've, I've heard from some people who have just who recently lost loved ones and they found this podcast and they've never even thought of any of this before. So Mm -hmm. for someone who doesn't know what channeling is, can you describe it? And can you explain what that looks like in the work that you do and how that's shifted with your near death experiences? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the, the near death definitely opened those things up for me. The channeling is that their guides and, you know, my guides get together to communicate according to what they, in that case, um, was for them. So for an an individual who wants me to channel music for them, they have an intent, they have something they want to energize Mm -hmm. or or wake up or or, um, solve in themselves. Music is transformation. It Mm -hmm. is transformation. Mm -hmm. And so all of these things are always about transformation. And so... So there's something that they want to transform or sit with or release or grieve or whatever it is that they've got going on. And um, so I look at their photo and I do a meditation and I hear sounds that come to me. So I prepare them in the studio. I have all, you know, everything that I hear, I prepare. I may not use all of them or most of them or I may use all of them, but I have everything ready to go. So I, the least amount of having to think about stuff. Then uh, when I'm ready to do it, I go into trance. And when spirit comes through, they use the library that's available to them. For example, I don't speak Spanish. So spirit's not going to speak. I I would say I do speak some Spanish. Uh, I don't speak Japanese. Mm -hmm. So spirit's not going to speak Japanese through me because it's not in the library that they have to, to work with. Right. But what they do have is a tremendous lifetime of musical experience and recording and all of this stuff which i can do asleep which Mm -hmm. is kind of what happens um so they come through and use a library and the music that comes out is not how i would probably compose something but it kind Mm -hmm. of sounds like something i would do so it's it's always odd to listen to it um so when I'm doing it, I'm obviously making choices and doing all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And then I come out of trance and I leave the studio because I don't want to get involved in anything technical at that point. And then I'll come back and I'll meditate for a little bit and check in, is more needed musically? And if there is, I'll go back in the trance. If there isn't, then I turn it on and I listen to it for the very first time. I have no idea what I'm going to hear. I don't remember recording any of it. Right, because when you're in those states, no, absolutely, it's like it's a total. I mean, when I've done, I've done medium work for people, and they'll come back to me and they'll say, "Oh, when you said 
you know, this. And I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about. But when I'm in my yeah. therapeutic work and someone says that to me, yeah. I, I can tell you where I was sitting and, and exactly. what they were wearing. That's and right. So it is a totally different experience. Gotcha. And, and the intellect will interfere uh, because if my, if my composer self was listening to this, I would probably go, yeah, see, I'd probably modulate here and I would lift this up and do that. And this isn't about any of that. It's mm -hmm. not even about music. It's not about, it's, it's purely vibrational. Mm -hmm. So some of it sounds like music and some of it sounds like sounds. And I, I have no attachment or concern about it and the less the better. So when I listen to it for the first time, then I'm listening to it as an engineer, as if somebody brought me a piece of music and they want it to sound good. So then I will make choices not about substance or content but just about how to frame it you know how to make each sound express as it feels that it, it wants to mm -hmm. and i let it go and my composer self would say yeah that sounds nice but i would want to change it no i don't i don't touch it i don't touch anything because it has nothing to do with me so then i then i send it to uh the the, the client the, mm -hmm. the person and um Give them some instruction about how to participate with that, with those sounds, like to try it, to, to help them let their intellect go and experience it as a purely energetic experience. How does your body feel when you're listening to it? What comes up in your mind without, please don't try to analyze what the instruments are or how mm -hmm. it was made or any of that stuff. Just how do you feel? How do you feel? How do you feel? What's happening in your body? How, how heavy would this sound feel if it was full of water? I mean, you know, there's all kinds of things that you can do. Um, and where does your mind go? How does your heart feel? Um, and just it's just an environment to sit in and that it's, it's working at a, um, at a cellular level. Mm -hmm. And you can come back a week later and listen to it and something else will shift and move or you'll have a new realization. That always happens with spirit guidance then that what you what you get in the moment there's so much more there that becomes available when you listen to it again I know you're going to be participating in a webinar on March 5th with Dr. Raymond Moody and Dr. Tony, who's an orthopedic surgeon who had a near-death experience when he was struck by lightning and came back as a concert pianist. And he's going to be on my show on Monday giving a brief overview of what he's going to be talking about as well. But if people wanted to attend this webinar, they can go to the University of Heaven Dot com and sign up for the webinar. If people are curious about where to find you, where can they find you? If they're interested, it sounds like you could, if they want music channels for them, you can do that. Mm -hmm. If they're Absolutely. looking for a lost loved one, you can perhaps, you're dipping your toe into that. Yeah, I, as I said, I've never, I've never advertised or taken money for, for that. So I'm, I'm thinking about that. I've done it mostly for friends and for mm -hmm. people who, you know when it when it comes up so obvious and I can find them, I I don't make any claims about being able to find everybody or something like right. that. But they can reach me at kevinbrahaneyfortune.com, and uh, there's a lot more information on that website. Thank you for asking. Mm -hmm. And um, and and there will also be a link to your website in my show notes as well. Great, great. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. And I certainly would be, you know, we'll see what you discuss with Raymond and their yeah. gang at University of Heaven. And then if there's stuff that's still, you know, you would love to talk about, I would absolutely love to have you back and we can oh, that'd be dig a great, little yeah. deeper into some of this sure. in the future. I really enjoyed it. I'd be happy to. It's fun. I love talking about stuff like this. <laughs> Me too. Well, thank you so much for participating today and being a part of my podcast. Like what you heard today and want to hear more? Curious about what comes next and what it all means? You can subscribe on iTunes. Just go to podcasts and find life, death, and the space between and hit subscribe. And you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Dr. Amy Robbins. Ask me any questions you might have. Let me know what else you'd love to hear about or just share your story. I can't wait to hear from you. <laughs>